Aidan, firstly, thank you so much for, for opening your doors to us here at, at Ballydoyle. Every time I, I come here, I'm totally blown away by it. Um, I, I'm sure you don't take it for granted, but this is a really special place, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely, Ali, and especially this time of the year, it's really at its best. It's uh, the trees and hedges and grass and everything is, is very green and uh, lush. Um, horses are very happy. The weather is obviously beautiful today and uh, no, a very, very special place. And you can see that the preparations are, are sort of final preparations are being done ahead of, of York, which I know is a meeting that you've had tremendous success at in the past. How much do you enjoy the week uh, and, in, and enjoy the show that they put on? Yeah, I know, sir. Obviously, really enjoy it. I love it, actually. It's, it's a beautiful place. Uh, it's, uh, everybody's very well looked after always. The ground is always beautiful. It's a very fair, fast track. Um, best horses are there uh, all the championship races it's very prestigious for a horse to win any of those big races so um, it's it's very special week really for us I suppose it goes without saying but as a trainer of not only brilliant horses but also with the breeding operation that comes with everything here at Coolmore to have a fair track is, is, a, is a real asset when you're going to the races because that's sort of one less sort of thing to worry about I suppose the best horse normally does win yeah it, it's it's obviously very flat it's very open there's a lot of space um I think it suits every horse really uh, you have to have speed in York I think the slow horse can get in trouble um but that's all um good it exposes the horse if, if they haven't got speed um but it's brilliant uh I think um like I said very fair you very rarely see a horse getting in trouble or getting boxed in and uh, the pace is usually on and and uh, that's what is always a big help to those races, really. Uh, if we can just reflect on some of the great horses you've had there in the past. Um, Duke of Marmalade, firstly, who, who won the International, the Judmont International. Um, actually, I think when it was run at Newmarket, because the weather was bad at, at York. But looking through his form, I think he was one from nine as a two and a three-year-old, something like that. And then his four-year-old career, I mean, we just saw an absolute monster, didn't we? Yeah, he was. He was very... He was very close to being very good at two and three and uh, he just had to make a little jump he had run very well in a lot of good races but didn't win especially as a three-year-old um the race were very competitive the horses that he was racing against were very competitive uh, but he was very tough hardy solid horse very genuine we spoke to johnny murcher about him and it was actually the first year that you sort of built up a relate uh, officially had had the relationship you did him being jockey here and probably really important to have a horse like that that was able to just dominate the group ones like he did to sort of solidify that partnership. Yeah, I think so. Listen, Johnny was obviously a great rider and they got on very well. And Johnny was very tough, very strong, and very committed. Um, he really suited the horse, really. Both of them had very much the same attributes. They, they were like super professional and none of them would give up. Um, and Johnny really suited him. Uh, but you're very straightforward. Johnny used to ride him and... Uh, over a mile and a quarter, a mile and a half, it, it didn't seem to matter. But uh, uh, like serious horse, really. As was Rip Van Winkle, who Johnny also rode, and 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 he could do it seemingly uh, over a variety of trips. He had so much talent that horse, didn't he? He did. Yeah, he was a miler really, but he nearly got a mile and a quarter. And um, I suppose if see the stars wasn't around, he he would have won more. I think over a mile and a quarter, see the stars used to always have him. Um, but he had a lot of class as well, and like obviously he was a Galileo with loads of speed. Yeah, you ran him in See the Stars' his derby as well. He was he was fourth in, in the derby behind See the Stars. That's right, absolutely. And the Eclipse, I think. Yeah. He was second to See the Stars. We thought after the derby, maybe we might get him over a mile and a quarter, but uh, he still beat us uh, in the Eclipse. What are your memories of his international win? Um, of Rip Van Winkle's uh, yeah, winning the international? Yeah, sure. The, the speed he had helped him at York. Mm. He, he had loads of gears and uh, uh, Johnny gave him a great ride. Um, Travelled very well and... Uh, um, he was a great mover. Yeah, it really showed his action, I think, uh, at York on the day. You're, you're probably not going to love this because I'm going to mention the three words, see the stars again, because Master Craftsman went to York and it was a, an amazing race to watch as a racing fan. We actually spoke to Johnny about the sort of idea on how you could, could beat see the stars. Leading into that race, Johnny said he was in absolutely, like couldn't have been in better form, Master Craftsman. Did you go there thinking this is our day to beat see the stars? Yeah, well, we knew we had a chance. Like obviously we saw what see the stars had done and we knew he wasn't going to be easy. And uh, Mick obviously knew um, 
our setup very well and uh, there was nobody ever probably suited or better than Mick did to see the stars because uh, we met him in a lot of his big races and we ran two and three horses against him and Mick would have always known the way we were thinking and what we would do and like obviously we always liked to make the races even and um, because then and the best horse will always come through and win and like we always uh, it's never hard to accept getting beat if it's a fair race and a strong run race and the best horse wins and then you accept it and you know where to go after and go on from there but when the pace is slow and it got messy and you got beat and you'd say if this hadn't happened if this hadn't happened uh, it's hard to accept getting beat that way so mm. it was tough when see the stars was around for us because he beat us a lot um but uh we always did our best to beat him and we tested him every day and uh, he he just kept coming through really johnny as you can imagine he's quite a charismatic fellow as you know and he was talking to us about you know perhaps you needed to eyeball see the stars to beat him maybe sit in behind and sort of blindside him perhaps and that was a really interesting i i imagine for you guys sat around the table discussion as to what the best thing to do was yeah i suppose we we I suppose we always knew whatever we did was going to be difficult. He was a relaxed horse. Uh, he stayed well and uh, he had speed. Um, so it was always going to be difficult. Um, and like I say, Mick used to ride him and Mick knew Johnny inside out and Johnny knew Mick inside out, really. Uh, the two of them were like serious competitors for a long time. And uh, I suppose um, the both of them were kind of, Johnny would have been absolutely at the height of his powers at the time. And, and Mick had all the wisdom from all the years gone by. And... Uh, knew how to play it when he needed to play it, you know. So it, tactically, looking at the two of them, it was, it was uh, super, really. I can see Master Carson. There's a picture of him behind you. He was a, he was a brilliant horse. He was, yeah. Very brave, strong, mm. tough horse. And, like, for a horse to do what he did, and he won a Heinz as a two-year-old, you know, so mm. uh, six furlongs over uh, as a two-year-old, you know. So uh, he was a brave horse. This year, once again, we've got the Coolmore, Wooten, Bassett, Nunthorpe. You've won that race plenty of times throughout your career. St Stravinsky and Mozart are two I want to talk about. Um, Stravinsky to begin with he won the July Cup and, and then the Nunthorpe did the six down to, to the five and it goes without saying but as you've touched on many times you need speed at, at your you need to have a really fast horse to win a Nunthorpe what are your memories of, of Stravinsky? Yeah he was very fast and uh, uh, he was a very uh, strong traveller and he used to quicken very well and I remember a little bit shocked looking at him actually a little bit first half of the race he was a little bit out of his comfort zone even uh, even though he was so fast. And I think York kind of caught him a little bit on su by surprise. Um, Mick gave him a great ride. He nursed him and nursed him and produced him. And he, di he did really quicken at the end. But I remember thinking, Jay, this track is really fast. But he was a fast horse and, and they were going fast enough for him. Um, I was a little bit shocked at the time, but still quickened and, and won well at the end. Uh, but Mick was very patient on him. Mozart, one of the most impressive winners of the Nunthorpe ever, I think. He went seven, six, five, didn't he? Because you won the jer jersey with him. It was a, it was a funny race. Something happened at the start with with Mick Canam. He, didn't he stumble out the gates or something? Yeah, he did, and and he went through his girt, meaning that his saddle would have went back as he as he jumped, you know. So um, and uh, Mick came up the stand side on him all the way, and like he let him run all the way. Let him. F he was flat to the boards the first half of the race, and he just kept coming. Um, but and the saddle was back around his quarters, so. Jeez. Again, Mick gave him a great ride to get him home, you know. But Stay uh, on it. Like, yeah, it was diffi <laughs> difficult what he did. Um, but as he jumped, the, the saddle just went. And um, But no, he, he was a great horse as well. So probably important in that moment for him to, to maintain a rhythm, basically. Because if that deviates, then Mick genuinely could have, you know, a, oh, a yeah. bad incident could have happened. Oh, yeah. It was very, very, I'd say it was very knife edge all the way for him. <laughs> so he, he had to let the horse roll, which he had to do because the horse needed every yard of five furlongs. And uh at the same time, he was trying to keep the saddle from going out across his tail, you know. So, um, no, it was, a, it was a bit of a tense moment watching it, but he gave him a great ride. Yeah, it was a, a brilliant race to watch as a fan. Turning our attentions to, to this year's sort of runners at the, uh, at the, the Skybed Ebor Festival, um, let's start with your Group 1 runners, if, if you like. Will high definition go to the Judmond that's International? That's the plan, yes. Um, his best run... This year, or last couple of years, has been at uh, the car over a mile and a quarter in the Tattersalls. Um, like obviously, if he goes, the pace will be strong. Like he he likes to go all the way. Um, he's in good form. Um, and uh, we're thinking of running him at the moment. Has it surprised you that that he is seemingly at his best over a mile and a quarter? Yeah, it is. Uh, I suppose. Um, 
he, I suppose he's a high tempo horse and maybe that's what suits him a long stride um, so we think that the track might suit him uh, we think uh, he will if he runs like the race will be strong and it'll be it will be um, open and uh, it will be honest so um, he, he's, his best runs are letting him roll so um, uh, that's what he does at his best we were talking about tactics and how you beat see the stars how do you beat a horse like Baid? Do you think? Ah, uh, yeah, very difficult. I'd say, um, like honestly, he he'll probably relax and he'll probably track whoever is there anyway. So uh, and he'd probably get a mile and a quarter. Um, uh, like William wouldn't be going a mile and a quarter if he didn't think he will get it. And I get there's every chance that he will get it, obviously, and get it well. Mm. Uh, obviously, with him in it, it's a f it's a fascinating fascinating race now, isn't it? Yeah, I oh, know it's brilliant, and that's what we want all the time. We want the best horses in the races, and then. We test him and try to expose them, um, but obviously uh, he's will be very difficult to expose, and uh, we'll be just uh, there to cheer him on. I'd say. Mm. How how dangerous are the wasps in Ballydoyle? No, they don't. They, they don't, don't, don't sting. They don't sting. Fantastic. Well, we'll carry on, carry on then, yeah. shall we? <laughs> um, Tuesday we'll run in the in the Darley Yorkshire Oaks. Yes, she's well. Uh, she's had a break. Um, we weren't sure where we were going to start her back, but she's came back very well and we're very happy with what she's doing. She's done well physically. Um, um, she's in great order and we think and hope it will be a nice start back for the autumn for her. She um, looks fantastic. We had a look at her picking on some grass yeah, out there. Yeah, physically she's done mm. great. And I suppose she's been a very late foal and she's been kind of playing catch up all the time. Um, the derby was a little bit of a mess for her and we don't probably accept that was her run in the derby. And uh, that's why um, we give her a little break when she came back and uh, no, looking forward to seeing her run again. Just because of how the the, the derby unfolded, yeah, she think, was back. Yeah, I think that it was two the race was in two halves, and she was in the second half. And the first three horses just did their own thing and got away, and uh, she had to come from the back, but she just couldn't do that where she was. And it was just the way the race set up. And I think J I think um, Ryan was tracking somebody, and he he went made a few attempts to get closer, and he couldn't. It's just the way it worked out, and then it was too late. Um, but she was keeping going. Um, and uh, we've been happy with her since. You, you've you've won the race with Snowfall and Love in the in the last two years. Are there any similarities between the the, the two of them, three of them? If uh, you like, yeah, this this filly is is um, uh, yeah, this filly is in good shape now. She's going into the autumn well, and she's uh, progressing, which is great. Um, Snowfall obviously was a great filly, and Love like great filly as well. You know, so um, there there would be some people that would look at Emily Upjohn's run. Tuesday's run in the Irish Derby and, and question the validity to a certain extent. I know Nashua has done, done very well, yeah. who was third in the edge. Question the validity of that form. What would you say to them? Uh, no, I don't think so. I think it was always going to be very difficult for Emily Upjohn in the, in the King George. And, like, it was just going to be a strongly run King George. And, like, a very strongly run King George will expose a three year old. Um, and, like, three year olds have good records in it. but that's if they can boss the situation a little bit. But against those horses, a three-year-old filly wasn't going to be able to do that. And she, it was always very likely she was going to get exposed, and, and I think you'd have to forgive her for that. Um, and um, and I, I suppose like we were very happy with our filly in Epson. Um, and uh, um, so we, we think that the form is, is good enough. And uh, like you said, there was other fillies in it that came out of it and ran very well as well. Good race of Yorkshire Oaks this year. You'll have... Um uh, Paddy Toomey's filly, Le Petit Coco, Alpinista, Sir Mark's talented filly. You've got Magical Lagoon as well from Jesse. On paper, that looks a hot race. Oh, uh, yeah, well, that's good, you know. So it's, it's, and hopefully they'll go on even pace. Um, that's what we hope. And then we'll see who's the best filly, mm -hmm. really. Um, but it's good when they're all there and it's, and it's competitive. Um, but hopefully there'll be pace on and that we'll go on even pace. I think Paddy's filly probably needs an even pace. Jesse's filly, the same. So, um, no, we're looking forward to it. Point Lonsdale's an interesting runner for you at, at, at York because we haven't seen him since he was down the field in the in the 2000 guineas. Can you just talk through what happened and, and where he's at now? Yeah, no, we're, we're very happy with him at the moment. Um, last year, he, he never ran beyond seven. He was a horse, always wanted a mile. Uh, and I suppose we did that because we he was the best type of horse we had for those races at that time. Um, so when he, his runs were so good um, last year, um, um, we kept him and started him at a mile in the guineas. Um, both, none of our horses came out of guineas this year. They, both of them kind of were a little bit jarred after, so we had to ease back on them, and, uh, um, and he was obviously a little bit like that. So, um, so none of them have kind of run since, and obviously uh, 
Luxembourg got a little injury, so he he got stopped as well. But um, we're very happy with him. Um, we always thought like he, a mile and a quarter, mile and a half, he would be very comfortable at. Uh, he's not too long back in full work, but what he's doing is nice. We think he'll improve plenty from the run, and uh, we're looking forward to seeing what he's going to do over a mile and a half. And and there's every chance that he could have plenty class over a mile and a half, but will improve plenty. And is this with one eye as a stepping stone to another race later on in the year? And yeah. if so, what is that? I, I think I'm not sure really. We we'll know when we we start him and see like. Does it look like he could get further? Does it look like he needs to come back? But but he is a classy horse, and uh, it will be interesting, and we'll be as interested as everyone else watching it to see what is going to happen. He's very relaxed. Uh, he's a lovely, low action, long striding horse, so the track should suit him. Um, very good natured, so uh, it will be interesting. So he might make up into a St Ledger horse, perhaps. It, it, perhaps he could want to come back shorter. Yeah. You know, so he could want to come back to his Irish Champion Stakes. He might want to go up to a. Uh, Doncaster St. Ledger horse is right so um, it, it's going to be very interesting and he, he could have plenty of class over that trip distance I, I get the sense you think he could have quite a fruitful end of season would well, that be fair? It, it's possible if everything goes well for him uh, like obviously nothing has went well for him yet, yet <laughs> yeah. this year like he's only had one run in the guineas and uh, even though he's down the field a bit he wasn't beaten that far mm. so um, it will be interesting OK, a couple of two-year-olds now to mention. Meditate in the uh, in the Lowther. She's three from three, won the Albany. Morge was second, boosted the form. Sydney Arms Chelsea, since who finished fifth, has come and won, out, won a group three in France. So that form's looking rock solid. Where's she at? She, she's very good. She's ready to run. Uh, she has a choice of the Lowther or the Deputant or a, a race in France on the Sunday, seven furlong, group two, Phillies race. Uh, so she will hopefully go to one of those. And um, we're very happy with her as well. Um, she would have a, a choice of the morning either. So that'll tell you the quality type filly she is. Um, but she's um, well, she's in good shape. Um, and it's, it's every chance. And so it's very possible that she could go there. I suppose the ground will dictate what you do with certain horses. You, soft ground might play your hand with a horse like Aesop Fables in the gym crack. Is that fair? Yeah, no, yeah, he, he won't mind good ground. But obviously it's a long time since he ran. And obviously we, we don't want to take any chance with him his first run back that he, he comes out of it feeling very well and we don't want him to feel any bit ouchy after it and it's like any athlete when they come back from the first run they, they can be a bit sore the muscle can be a bit sore so we'll wait as long as we can to uh, decide about him we, we always loved him he won his maiden at uh, Navin and uh, we always thought six and seven wouldn't be any problem for him and, and he's in a good place at the moment obviously I can't not talk about the horse is probably going to be champion two-year-old given what he did the other day but little big bear uh, in the in the phoenix everyone's written about it spoken about it and it you know every superlative has been used to describe that performance having had time to reflect on it how do you assess it yeah sure he he, he was always a very special horse from day one always um i remember we were absolutely dumbfounded when he got beat first time. Do you remember that? Have you seen that clip that's doing the round of, of a press day here when someone, s you s someone said... I, I actually remember saying it at press day and obviously it was... Someone said, I have, have said a fiver, you said you could have more on. I shouldn't have said it, yeah. So, um, but uh, there you go. But listen, that's horse It's a great clip that, though. It's yeah, nice to see. Yeah, but that's horse racing. And, and there's no such thing as a certainty. Um, but he, he was always like working very special. He, like, he's a big, powerful, good-natured horse with loads of speed and... Ryan said he'll get seven standing on his ear, you know, so after the last day. And a horse with that type of pace is very unusual. He, he, he leaves the gates. He doesn't matter when someone leads him. He's very happy to lead. Uh, he coasts and, and he quickens, you know. So he's so uncomplicated, unusual horse. It's uh, unbelievable, really. There was a shot of him wa almost sort of floating down to the start as well. It, it looks to just be so natural to him. Yeah, he does. Is that same at, the he, same at home? Yeah, he's, he's the same. He course, he's a beautiful action, lovely balance. He's good wide back on him and big front on him. And, you know, he's he's, he's a beautiful horse, really. You 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 alluded to the Nunthorpe, but you've ruled that out, and he's going to the National. That's the plan, yes. Um, like we could have, um, and there wouldn't have been no problem to him. We didn't think, uh, like obviously... Uh, he went to Ascot and he won, I think, the Windsor Castle and mm. he was green enough through the race, but he, he still was able to get it together and win nicely. So, um, uh, no, the, the plan at the moment is to go to the national stakes and, and it should suit him lovely. Do you have plans beyond that? No, I obviously I always take one race at a time. Mm. Um, and uh, 
Yes, and we thought it would be just a nice place for him to go again. He'd come back and he has a nice little break back to the car again. And, you know, so we, we thought it would suit him lovely. Given what Ryan said about seven furlongs standing on his head, are we dealing with a guineas horse next year? I, listen, it looks that way, you know, so, um, you know, everything he's doing, is it looks that way. And, uh, and like, he looks to be, uh, he looks to be a, a little bit uh, different. You get asked this question so many times and I'm almost embarrassed to ask it, but... At this stage of his career, compared to all the very good horses you've had, where do you think he fits into the spectrum? Yeah, sure. It's, it's always very difficult to, to say that, but he does look very unusual um, in that he's so uncomplicated. It, it, there's no such thing as tactics with him. Uh, he has all the speed in the world, and, and he runs through the line. So uh, at this stage, like he, he looks like very, very different. Just a very quick line, if I can, on two horses, two-year-olds. August Roden, where are we at with, with that horse? Um, Is it August Roden? He's sort of prominent in the... I don't know whether I've pronounced it correctly. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, uh, yeah. Is um, it August, Augusta uh, uh, Roden? Augusta or Roden, yeah, yeah, exactly. Sorry, I got the last one. Oh, um, <laughs> no, he's a, a deep impact horse. Mm. Yes, yeah, he's lovely. Um, we're very happy with him. Um, it's possible that he could appear in the boomerang at Leperstown. Right. And um, we're just trying to take our time with him, even though he, he came earlier than we wanted and he ran earlier than he wanted, but we're just trying to hold back a little bit. So that's what we're thinking at the moment with him. Okay. It's the two-year-old race champions weekend at Leperstown. Yeah. And Alfred Munnings? Yes, Alfred Munnings had a little fracture on his can on his splint bone right. after he ran at Ascot. In the Chesham? Yes. So uh, we had to stop with him, and he's just started back again. So he's probably going to run out of time for this year. Okay. So, um, but at least uh, we think that that was the reason for his his disappointing run. Okay, I really appreciate the um, the updates on those. Yeah. Uh, can I speak more 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 generally, really, yes. about uh, I guess you as as a trainer because. I look out the window behind you, blue skies, beautiful garden. It's obviously a really busy time of year, but how do you and are you able to switch off away from it and, in, and enjoy a day like today without thinking about racing, even though you're talking yeah, to me I about know. racing? Yeah, it's not obviously this time of the year it's important and, and obviously every minute of the day is important. So you don't switch off, or you don't stop thinking because uh, you don't have the time. Uh, there's a lot of balls up in the air at the moment and, and they're floating and you don't know where they're going to land. So if you're not watching them, like you have no idea where they're going to land. So if you're watching them, you think you might know. So really, there's probably not enough hours in the day this time of the year, you know. So you, if you can survive, obviously, the next few months, and if you can get into the winter, you might get to the next year. But like it's it's full on this time of the year, and that's just the way it is. And and uh, I suppose we this is what we do, uh, this is what we love. And like there's a, a lot of people discussing everything at the moment. So there's a, a lot of to and fro and, and there's a lot of communication between everybody and you kind of have to keep that smooth and uh, all those lines open so that we have a better chance of coming to, to the right uh, conclusions about decisions and that really. I, I saw a great interview with you and someone asked you why you loved racing and you answered by saying, because you love, and we all do it, solving the, the puzzle of it. So, so is that what you're thinking about all the time? Yeah, well, I, I suppose, listen, obviously w we need to get results because it is a business and, uh, and, and obviously you need all the hours of the day to be thinking about it. But if, if you enjoy and you love doing what you're doing, it's kind of our hobby as well as our job. So it, it's uh, fascinating really to, to see different horses coming in with different traits and you're trying to work out all the time where you're going to go. Most horses only stay here like two years anyway. So you don't have a lot of time. Um, so, uh, and there's so much things change and there's so many variables that you can't control. So um, you're making decisions all the time and most of them will be wrong. But you, if you make, if you think you're making the right decision at the time and it goes wrong, then so be it. But you have to be kind of clear and uh, open as you can be all the time because it's easy to accept it then. But if you make a decision and you're not clear and you say maybe if I, hadn't have been so tired if I hadn't have seen that or hadn't have seen that, then that's hard to accept. But if you're 100% honest, as much as you can be all the time and it goes wrong, you just have to accept it and move on and learn from it. Do you have time to think about racing? I'm mindful to say politics, because it's not necessarily politics, but there are issues that racing is faced with, both in England and in Ireland, getting crowds into the races, for example. Attendance figures are down, I think, across the board. 
maybe that's post COVID, who knows? But do you have time to think about that? Because either these are important issues for our industry. Yeah, I, I think so. But listen, obviously there's, there's people that that's their job to do that. But I always think is is to get people in is, is the important thing and keep the gate fee as low as possible, get the people in and then let them uh, get going and everything else can happen inside. But I think it's important to get in people and get in the families. And, and I don't think, uh, and maybe I'm wrong, but I don't think uh, gate fees make any big difference to any race course now anyway. Um, I, I, but maybe I'm wrong saying that. But I, I think if, if you can get the crowds in and get the people watching and get the people watching on telly and then it'll all come from there, I think. But maybe I'm saying that now and I don't know enough about it, mm. really. So there's a lot of people in better positions that understand it better than me. But it is important to get people in, get families in and, and uh, get people, I suppose... Um, used to racing or involved in racing or with an interest in racing from a very young age i think um i i think um w was going to the races for the first time when you were a child was that what gave i know obviously sort yes. of steeped in racing but yes but but was that what gave you the the real bug for it yeah no i, I think so and i i think uh, i know some people are, are are against betting but i, I think like it's, it's not a, a bad thing like if if uh, if it's controlled and and like like i remember um going racing and uh, you'd go and pint a pint and you'd have a couple of euros on a horse and it's interesting and I think all those things are you know what I mean and and, and I think maybe some things are blown out of proportion but I think you have to get people whatever interests them you know to mm. go and do it and feel it and see it and get involved and now I'm speaking about all this and I'm not near qualified enough to be speaking about it I don't know enough about it but mm. like you say it is important that everybody goes racing but just one other issue I do want to ask you about if, if I can and that that's because you know about horse stock and, and quantity, et cetera, quality horses that you deal with here. William Haggis recently said he'd cut 300 fixtures. Field sizes, they, w they will be brilliant at York, but they always are because of the prize money that they put on. Do you think, particularly in, in the UK, there's, there's too much racing? And, and are you concerned about the, the future if it carries on on the path it's on at the moment? I, I think it's, listen, um it's very hard to cut fixtures because everyone has to make a living and everyone is only trying to survive and and uh, ev everyone needs to win races and everybody has to live so it, it's um uh, listen it's probably a balancing act somewhere and and like i don't know enough about it to be mm. really commenting but um i think everyone has to have a chance um there ca there is probably such a thing as too much racing mm. um for everybody everyone works very hard in this game um lads in the yards and everyone else um it, it is possible but i suppose everyone has to agree that and the trainers and the owners all have to be happy about it you know but i i think um people do have to have a little bit of time as well you know so mm. um people have to have family time and work time it all has to kind of balance up somewhere doesn't it really De definitely um uh, and then when you are if you ever are able just to sort of stroll around these beautiful gardens do you ever think like us sort of dreamy racing fans when you and going into the judgment international there's a big conversation about see the stars versus franklin and again i'm sorry for bringing see the stars his name into the, the room here no. <laughs> he was a he was a champion but yes. but lots of people saying who would who would have won you had st nicholas abbey against franklin the international master craftsman against see the stars we are obviously dealing with a hypothetical but who do you think would have come out on top in that oh, argument and this is very difficult um, like they were two great like unbelievable horses and, and we raced plenty against both um like obviously uh see the stars a very good stallion um um like frankel is just his, his statistics are he's like a record-breaking yeah, stallion his statistics now, are incredible yeah. you know already um and uh, and it's day in day out really so um you know incredible horse and like he did it all the way from a mile up, didn't he? You know, so uh, he, like he was like incredible, incredible horse, like brilliantly bred, trained, reared, ridden. You know, so um, and see the stars is the same. You know, so two great stallions. You know, so um, very d very difficult question. Um, but I could like you can only dream about that kind of stuff. You know, <laughs> but like it was great to witness both of them racing really. Mm. Do, do, do you ever sit around the sort of table with the family and talk about whether any of your great champions in the past would have, you know, would have, would have horse X beaten ho horse Y? And when you like 
look back at these incredible images here in this room with these champion horses. Do you ever chat like that, like w most no. racing fans would in the bars, you know? Yeah, no, not really. Uh, listen, obviously we don't get much time. Like <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it, it, you're lucky if you get to see the front page of the paper. You really? Know? So that's how busy this time mm. of the year is. And you don't, and that's the way it is. And like, obviously, when that race is over, it's the next. Mm. And because what has happened in the past really doesn't matter. And uh, like we're always trying to look to the future and find the next one and move on and solve the next puzzle and look after the next best horse and look for the best horse. You know, that's the way it is. And, and uh, I suppose that's... Um, Do you not find that really stressful? Well, listen, it, it's obviously uh, it's obviously what we do. It's what we love doing. And uh, it, it's you just... You don't have much time for thinking about what has happened. You mm. kind of focus on the present and the future, you know, and it's really the present to focus on the the present because it's happening. And then you're looking to the future, but you, you can't control that anyway. So uh, you're trying to control what's in front of you at the minute on the day, really. You know. Just one other horse to, to talk about the future with, it, if, if I can, Kit Prios. W is he going to St. Ledger next? Yes, that's the plan. Uh, How did he come out very good, good with the Yeah, he, he's a lovely, straightforward, honest horse. Um, typical Galileo, very genuine, uh, very easy to deal with. Um, that was always the plan, to go back to the Irish Ledger, back to a mile and six, and then see after that. So uh, does he go back shorter again, or wh where do, does he go? Might he run in an arc? He'd it's done it before. Yeah, it, it's possible. It's Anything is possible for him. But the three main races that, that were on his programme were obviously Ascot um, and then to go to Goodwood and then come to the Curra this year. And then we would see after that. So um, we're, we're on the, the last leg of it at the moment. Um, when you look ahead to, to next week, obviously you have big winners all around the world, but we were touching on some magical moments at York with your horses with see the stars with Frankel. I, I get the sense that having a winner there as a trainer or an owner is very special because of the appreciation that the crowd and the race course give on these very special equine talents. Is that the sense you get when you come into that famous winner's enclosure at York? Yeah, I think I think the Yorkshire people and everyone goes racing in York really appreciate horses. Um, I suppose they're very close to uh, the animals. Um, People are very friendly. Um, they, like they look after everybody to meet people everywhere. Everyone is looking after everybody. And it, it's just a lovely, lovely atmosphere. A very unique atmosphere, I suppose. And the same people kind of turn up there every year that you mightn't see at other races. Um, obviously, the winner's enclosure is a, a lovely area. Um, when you walk back in there and the stands are behind and the crowds are looking down into it. And it's a... It's a it's it's lovely atmosphere really, and it's usually warm, and it's it's a uh, I, th I think it's a very special place really. Uh, and finally, this might be a slightly unfair question, but if someone was watching this who isn't a racing fan, and we've spoken about a couple of issues in racing at the moment, we've spoken about a great week coming up. What would you say to them about why they should get into racing as a sport? I, I think it's 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 a lovely uh, passion for somebody that will bring them through their whole life, um, and like we know an awful lot of older people that don't go racing anymore and they have the paper and that's what they live for every day to, to watch the characters and the jockeys, the owners, the trainers and what they say and, and obviously the, you project it out to the world. Um, to go racing at a very young age, I, I think for kids it, it can be very exciting. It can change their focus through their whole life um, away from a lot of other stuff. It can be a great interest. They can work hard in other jobs and they can still do that and really enjoy it. And it's a it's an outlet for them. And having a bet is not a bad thing. It's an interest. And uh, it's uh, it, it, it gives people great interest. And, and it's, it's uh, I think, um, it's no harm. Um, and uh, and um, it gives them something to think about. Uh, I think it's, it's if people could get involved in racing at a very young age, very young age, I think it would stand them in good stead through their whole life all the way from start to beginning and do you see racing transform <coughs> this s some people who work for you and, and the youngsters that come here and work at Cornwall can it be a transformative industry for them to work in oh absolutely people can develop a lot and they they can uh, learn an awful lot of life skills how to manage horses and manage people and they can go on and do a lot of other stuff we have a lot of people that would come here in the middle of their college careers and uh, go on then and do other jobs but they're still hooked up in racing uh, it's a great interest and a passion for them for the rest of their life, no matter what they do. 
Um, there's great people work in racing. People work very hard in racing. It gives them a great work work ethic, and uh, and a great um, respect for human beings and for animals. I think in a very healthy way. Aidan, fascinating as always. Thank you so much, and the very best of luck at York. Pleasure, uh, Ollie. Thank you very much.